how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. To infinity and beyond. Some people without brains do an awful lot of talking, don't they? It's classified. You talking to me? I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. I can't lie! Expecto Patronum! Entertainment X. You never know what you're going to get. For this episode, I chat with Kerry Kirkpatrick. I spoke with his brother Wayne earlier this year, and he has some, there were some wonderful stories that Wayne had shared about Kerry in the beginning of his career and what they did to create connections and meet people. And it became very evident after talking with Wayne that I must have his brother on to hear in his own, in Kerry's own words, what uh, his life path has been up to this point. And we cover a lot. It's really a wonderful conversation about his uh, ups and downs, lessons learned, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope you enjoy this episode and keep on keeping on. We're back. I'm Clayton Howe. And today with me on the phone is Carrie Kirkpatrick. Carrie, thank you for chatting with me today. My pleasure. I want to get right into it. Uh, and this is almost a continuation from the conversation I had with your brother, Wayne. I want to talk about that demo tape that you left with a manager on behalf of your brother. Um, if you could tell that story, I would love to hear it. Uh, well, um, when we were kids, we were growing up in Baton Rouge, uh, Louisiana, and both of us got into you know, music and musical theater and, and songwriting uh, and just entertaining kind of early. I, I did my first play when I was... 13, I guess. Um, and Wayne was doing musicals at our high school and was also doing a lot of singer songwriter, um, type things. And, uh, I had thought I was going to be an actor. Uh, Wayne moved away to go to Belmont college in Nashville, which is now Belmont university. And, uh, um, I actually got accepted to some, uh, professional theater training schools. Uh, but then over the summer between my senior year and freshman year, I kind of had a change of heart. And for some reason, I thought I was going to go be Wayne's manager. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know why, uh, but I, I was working at a dinner theater, actually, and had kind of a, a bad summer experience and uh, and thought, no, nah, this is crazy. I'm not going to pursue acting. So I moved to Nashville and went to Belmont and roomed with Wayne and uh, majored in music business. And one of the uh, assignments when you're majoring in music business is that you have to interview someone in the music business. And Wayne and I were big uh, Amy Grant fans. Um, and a lot of the music that Wayne was writing was contemporary Christian music. Um, so I, I went and um, interviewed Amy Grant. And in the interview, basically all I did was talk about Wayne. Every, every story she would tell, I, I just kept bringing it around to, oh, yeah, my brother does this. And, um, and through that process, I met Amy's managers. Um, particularly, I met the assistant to Amy's managers. And this is, um, this is the key to any – these are the gatekeepers, the assistants. Um, <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's how, you know, literally, that's how you get your foot in the door. They're usually sitting just on the other side of the door. Uh, and, um, I got to know her and, and I got to know her through all of the, all of the many phone calls that it took to schedule a meeting with Amy Grant, uh, um, okay. and canceling and, and her calling and saying, I'm so sorry, but Amy had to cancel and, and, you know, and being understanding and funny and as charming as I could be. And, uh, so after the interview finally happened, her name was Beverly and, uh, I called her up and I said, I'd really like to take you to lunch. Um, to say thank you. Now, look, I was 18 at the time, just turning 19. So, and she was like, oh, you don't have to do that. I said, oh, I want to. And then I went to lunch. And then at the end of that lunch, I had a tape that had three of Wayne's songs on it. And I said, I don't know if you can pass this along to Mike. And her, Mike Blanton was uh, Amy's manager. And, uh, and she was like, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, well, I, I was working at a store called uh, Audio Systems, which was, you know, like a kind of like a mini Best Buy. And I was working in the warehouse 
unboxing, you know, boxing things, unboxing. Um, and uh, I had left that as my work number. And uh, <laughs> I'm in the warehouse. I'm uh, I'm in the warehouse one day and I hear Carrie. There's a call from Mike Blanton for you. I was like, oh oh, you know. And I go behind some boxes. Like, oh yes, hello. And uh, and he said, hey man, uh, I listened to these songs and uh, Wayne had written a song called She's the One. And he said, that's She's the One, man. That's a hit. That's a great song. Uh, I said, yeah. Well, there's more where that comes from. And I yeah. said, uh, he said, well, I'd like to hear more. So I was like, okay. So I had read somewhere that it's like you know, leave them wanting more. So um. Yeah, I brought him a, I brought over a tape and dropped it off with two more songs. And by the way, Wayne hasn't met any of these people. I'm, I'm coming home and it's like, what did, what did she say? What did he say? Yeah. <laughs> I, I have no, I have no idea why he would put his, uh, faith and career in my, in the hands of his 18 year old brother. But, um, I think part of it was because, um, Wayne's a, a lot less extroverted than I was, particularly when I was a teenager. And um, so I was sort of like, yeah, I'll go, I'll go do this. He wouldn't, he would never have kind of pushed himself on somebody like that. And it's kind of easier when somebody else is doing it. So, yeah. Um, so I submitted another tape and got another call and I was like, yeah, there's more from that. And, <laughs> and Mike very gingerly said, uh, you think we could meet Wayne? <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 I can arrange that as his manager. And um, so, yeah, that's um, we went and had a meeting. And um, at the time, Mike said, you know, uh, we're kind of like a big family here and we have a team, you know, songwriters. And we'd like to uh, put you together with some of our other writers and start writing some stuff and kind of invite you into the family. And that was a that was a big day for Wayne because he. He after that meeting he went and wrote with a guy named Billy Sprague and that was his first record cut ever, um, and then ended up writing for Amy uh, a couple of songs on her unguarded record and then wrote a hit for her called Every Heartbeat and um, had you know had a started a long relationship that continues to this day uh, with her and a lot of those artists and that's where. You know, so that whole relationship um, through that group is what introduced Wayne to Michael W. Smith and um, where he went out on tour with him and then produced the tour and co-produced, I mean, co-wrote a bunch of songs, co-produced one of Amy's uh, records. Um, so, and a bunch of other artists there is where Wayne kind of started cutting his two teeth as a, as a producer. Um, and I had... I had produced a, a showcase for Wayne uh, in Nashville at a place called the Bluebird Cafe, which is um, now pretty, really, I mean, it was famous then, but it's really famous now because it's featured on the show Nashville. Yeah, um, yeah. But I, you know, I produced this you know, showcase and sent out invitations and changed my last name so that it wouldn't look like an nepotism. So I just used my middle name as my last name, which was James. <laughs> so, um, and again, you know, by, I think maybe I'm 19 by now. And uh, I produced this showcase and a bunch of people came. And while I was sitting there watching the showcase, I was kind of standing off to the side and watching the audience react. And just some kind of light bulb went off in my head. I was like, I can't do this for the rest of my life. I can't, <laughs> I can't, I can't stand over here and watch Wayne the rest of my life. You know, not only did I have too much ambition and you know, a healthy amount of ego myself, but I was, I was kind of starting to get the performing bug again. So I went, um, I dropped out of Belmont because I got into a couple of shows in Nashville. And then I went and auditioned at a thing called the SETCs, which are the Southeastern theater conference auditions. Oh yeah. And, um, got a show down in Vero beach, Florida, where I went and did two shows. And then I auditioned for, um, a company that performed at Epcot Center uh, called Sac Theater, and I got that. So I ended up moving to Orlando for about a year and a half doing improvisational street theater at Epcot Center. Um, and that's kind of where I started writing again. Wayne and, Wayne and I actually um, started writing a musical uh, with another friend of ours. Um, and... Uh, and I really started writing 
um, I, I think part of it was, um, I think it was selfishly motivated. I started writing because nobody was writing good parts for me. <laughs> um, a good reason. A, as an actor. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, well, you know, Stallone did it with Rocky and, you know, all these, I'll do it. Yeah. I'll start writing. And I, I literally started writing a, a script um, while I, you know, while I was in, still in Nashville, I just was tinkering around because I had an idea. Uh, and it was, um, you know, something that was a, a, a vehicle for me. <clears throat> and I was pretty, um, you know, I was pretty uh, undaunted back then. I mean, I guess I still am. But uh, I like somebody told me when I was a teenager, like, you look a lot like Rick Springfield. <laughs> um, you could be brothers. And then I thought, oh, really? And I had a few people tell me that. Yeah. And so just, I was like, oh, well, that's cool. So I sent a letter to General Hospital that said, hey, people tell me I look like Rick Springfield and uh, I could be his brother. So do you got any parts for his brothers on that? Because he was on that show at the time. Right. I was like, okay. And of course, no one responded, but that's, that's kind of who I was. Um, and, um, and then, so from, uh, while I was in Florida, I started doing a lot more writing with this improv troupe. A part of it was because I was the guy who could type. Um, but it also became a place where I, I think I figured out I have a, a, I had a pretty good feel for structure, um, just sort of an, an innate ability to take all these sort of disparate ideas that were that we would improv out and if we needed to kind of structure we would do these shows that were kind of half improv that had some structure that needed needed some story to push them along okay and um so i and because i could type really fast because i took typing in high school i was like yeah i'll type them up um and uh so i ended up kind of it became a really useful skill later in my career because it, it became what i did a lot as a screenwriter um, which is when you're rewriting or, or taking a script that doesn't quite work and, and, and figuring it out. It was from those sort of early days of taking all these ideas and figuring out which ones belonged and which ones didn't and which ones bogged the pace down and stuff like that. And uh, so I started getting interested in writing more full time. And uh, a guy that I knew at Disney, I said, I'm kind of toying around with the idea of going to film school. And, uh, you know, to study screenwriting. And he said, well, you know, where I went is the only place to go as far as I'm concerned. And that's USC. Yeah. And uh, I was kind of like, oh, OK, well, I'll apply there. Um, <laughs> I really didn't. I really <laughs> I, I really didn't know that it was like the best film school in the country or the world. Uh, I was kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm sure it makes sense. It's in Los Angeles. And um I think I looked up four film schools, probably USC, UCLA, NYU, and uh, and Columbia maybe. And um, and uh, I swear the reason why I applied to uh, USC is because it was a BFA program. And when I was looking at the curriculum, you could start taking film classes right away. Right. And uh, I was in a real hurry, you know, to get going. So. The, the other co courses, which were BA, and it's like, what? I got to take foreign language and uh, algebra? I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so I really only applied to USC. Okay. And, uh, and uh, again, I mean, I don't know if people listening, if, if the point of he to hearing some of these origin stories is, it is, what do I do? But part of it is... It definitely uh, is. I, I have this mantra, like, you have to hear no at least three times before it's a real no, because no is the easiest answer that any, you know, it's just the safest answer. Yeah. Um, no for people is, is no, no risk taking, you know? Um, and so, um, and you got to go give people a reason to say yes. Um, so and I, I called up uh, the office, the, the, the screenwriting programs office at USC to book a tour um, or to, you know, just to, to talk about the interview process. And I called and this woman answered, uh, her name was Diane. And, and uh, I said, yeah, I'd want to talk about an interview. Oh, we don't interview. And I quickly 
just lied through my teeth. I was like, well, I don't, I don't mean an interview. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be in town, uh, to, and uh, I wonder if I can just come by the office and say hi. Oh, she was like, oh, yeah, sure, you can do that. <laughs> I was not going to be in town. I, I hung up the phone and called and booked a ticket to L.A. Um, because I knew, you know, I didn't have awesome test scores. Um, and, you know, I had dropped out of Belmont. I mean, I had finished a semester, but I was, you know, was a B student. And so I knew enough to know, like, I've got to somehow get my application out of just the pile that's like one of many. Yeah. Um, so I, I went to USC and I did the normal college tour and then I dropped by the office and talked to uh, Diane and Diane weirdly, I found out she was Liberace's niece. Oh my God. And, uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, I just talked to her and talked about what I was doing in Florida and the writing I had been doing and the improv and, I had written this, I had this idea that I was pursuing actually professionally, like um, uh, the things to, to put in front of movies to tell people no talking uh, and the concession stand is open. And I had written these sort of comedy sketches and had actually approached Coca-Cola about sponsoring them. Wow. Um, and all that was kind of on my resume, if you will. Right. And uh, again, just, just like that story with, with Beverly and Wayne, it's the assistant. She was the assistant to the head of the program. Yeah. Um, and I went in and talked to her, and now she had a face with the name, and she uh, had a sense of who I was. And she went in to the head of the program and said, you know, this guy, I think, uh, belongs here. And here's the stuff. And they admitted me as a sophomore, actually, um, so I, I skipped the second semester of my freshman year because they thought by then I was 21 and they thought me being with a bunch of 18 year olds just coming in might not have been good. And I had to do a bunch of stuff to make up for some credits. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I suddenly found myself, you know, in the USC film school and just writing, uh, furiously for, for two years. So that was 86. 86 through 88, um, uh, writing a lot and, um, uh, uh, a, a, a friend of mine moved there from Baton Rouge and was a music major. And, uh, he and I did shows together in high school and we drove down to San Diego one time. I was a huge Steven Sondheim fan and, and, uh, into the woods was doing its out of town tryout at the, uh, at the old globe in San Diego. And I was like, we've got to go see this Sondheim show. Yeah. Um, and I, I went and was so sort of inspired. And, and uh, you know, I had always wanted to write musical theater as well as, as really anything. But, I, you know, music theater has always been my first love. And, and we were driving back from San Diego to L.A. And I said to his name was Byron Simpson. And I remember saying to him, how can we write musicals and get paid to do it? Like, how can we <laughs> avoid all of the, all of that struggle and suffering? Yeah. Um, you know, cause I really, I didn't at the time, I mean, I was at USC and I was trying to do some music, you know, movie stuff, but I, so I didn't want to move to New York and, and, um, and go that, that route. I was trying to figure out how to shortcut the, uh, all the pain and hardship. And we kind of said, well, Disney animation, that's, like that's the only place that, so this was 87. This was the only place that was really making anything musical. Right. And on that drive, we came up with an idea for an animated musical called once upon a Bayou, since all of, we were from Louisiana right. and, uh, came up with the story, which in retrospect was super juvenile. Um, and knowing what I know now about animation, I can see why it never would have worked, but, we um, wrote it, um, and they were at USC. They were doing this um, screenwriters showcase where they, the, the head of the program, had the idea that that the not very good idea, except it did serve me well. But to do um, screenplay readings and invite people from the entertainment industry to come hear them, so we'd hire some actors and 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 read screenplays, which is torture. It's just 
it's a torturous, <laughs> you know, to hear somebody sitting there and reading excerpts of someone going cut to exterior far, you know, it's terrible. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, mine, we were presenting this animated thing. So I had an artist that designed some characters. So I had slides and we had songs. So in terms of pure entertainment value, um, ours was kind of the hit of the evening because it was not boring and there were five songs and, and uh, a friend of mine that I had worked with in Florida knew the head of development at Disney animation. Um, and he said, I, I, I think he should um, hear this or see this. So I sent the screenplay over, he sent it to him. And then I got a call from him and he was like, yeah, I don't, I don't love this. Sorry. And I said, well, that's cause you haven't heard the music. <laughs> I was very, I was very pushy. I was like, well, you're just hearing half of it. I mean, it's a musical and you, you got to hear the music. And, uh, I was like, I can, I didn't have a studio or anything, you know? And he was like, all right, we'll come in and play me the music then. Wow. And uh, so me and Byron went there and they had a room with a piano and then we played all the songs live for them and sang them. And um, then he was like, well, you're right. That is better, but we still don't want to make this movie, but it is, we do like the talent. It's rare that we have somebody who can write music, lyrics and screenplay. So they offered us a, a summer internship was uh, where the, we was the summer internship yeah. a common thing or was this like a first ever out of the blue summer internship that they were offering? No, they had a program okay. that they were, that they were doing through animation where they were like, we'll hire some summer interns. It was $360 a week. <laughs> um, and, um, so we went in and they were making these Mickey, Mickey Mouse featurettes, these little 20 minute featurettes, which was Mickey does the classics. And um, it, the only one that actually got made out of this program was called um, the Prince and the Pauper. Yeah. Um, but so Byron and I had an office so that we shared and uh, we were writing like we wrote Mickey's Fair Goofy, which was the, Pygmalion story with Mickey and Goofy and we wrote Mickey and the Emperor's new clothes and Mickey the Pied Piper and you know, it was all stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and through writing that, um, they liked what they saw and offered us a three year staff writing deal. Um, and so a slight bump in pay and, uh, and then before long, uh, and so I thought, yeah, before long they put us on, um, the rescuers down under, which was being made. Um, and at the time I was still in school trying to finish, but I, the producer of rescuers down under, uh, said who's Tom Schumacher, who's now the head of Disney theatrical, um, said, yeah, you, you can't, you can't go to school and write a movie that's being made. You're going to have to figure out what you want to do. So I right. dropped out of SC in my senior year, two weeks into my senior year. And, and told the head of the department who said I was making a terrible mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, well, I said, I'm here to get a screenwriting degree. And uh, they just offered me a screenwriting job. I don't quite see how this is a mistake, but, um, right. and I was paying, <laughs> I was paying for USC myself and it was about 30 grand a year, you know? And, and, uh, I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I got to go make some money. Right. And, uh, I said, I'll tell you what though, uh, if the work dries up, uh, and this goes nowhere. I'll come back and finish. You have my word. And um, oh. knock on wood, I've never been out of work since then. So I'm like, oh my goodness. Um, uh, so um, uh, yeah, that's you know. And then that just started along, you know, working at Disney. So I did Rescuers Down Under, and then um, Disney. After my staff deal ended, they were doing the third Honey I Shrunk the Kids movie, and asked me to work on that, which I did. Uh, and then James and the giant peach was kind of floundering and in trouble. And, um, so I, I got that job and that job was James was being executive produced by a guy named Jake Everts who had a deal with Ardman, um, which led to doing chicken run, which, you know, it just sort of, which reintroduced me to Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was my first boss at, uh, Disney animation and then now started DreamWorks. And so then I 
you know, after Chicken Run, I ended up in a 20 year relationship with, with DreamWorks doing stuff on and off for them. And, and, uh, so that, that's kind of how the whole career, uh, got started. Um, so, wow. Well, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I, I, well, I want to start by saying thank you. You, you saved me a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> that was the most comprehensive introduction to the career that I've ever gotten on this show. I really appreciate that. Oh, good. I definitely wrote down some questions along the way. I'm curious, uh, going all the way back to Beverly, the con- the conscious kindness, to be kind to her, to know to talk to her, was that taught to you? Were you just laying in bed thinking of ways to get in touch with the right people? Did you have a mentor? Well, you know, I probably picked some of it up, up by osmosis through my dad, who um, has always been in some form of sales. I mean, growing up when our dad was a preacher uh, at a small church, but before that, he sold insurance, he sold real estate, um, and even when he was preaching to supplement his income, he, he was always selling something. <laughs> and, right. and cynically, I... I could say that preaching is its own form of sales. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. you're just selling uh, salvation as opposed to, a, you know, a car. But um, uh, so I'm, I'm sure I picked up some stuff from him. Um, but I think, you know, I really think part of it is a... Um, a built-in tenacity. I, I kind of, I mean, it took me a few years to realize that this is my, uh, my mantra that, that allows me to go into things. But I basically say, well, somebody gets to do this. Why not me? Right. You know, and, uh, it took me a while to realize that that is, um, I was talking to a friend of mine and I told him that mantra and he said, yeah, I don't, I don't have that, you know? <laughs> right, right. So like, people don't... I, I realize that there's a lot of a lot of people out there who it's like somebody gets to do this and it probably won't be me <laughs> is, is, yeah. is the way a lot of people think. And then right. so the ruthless side of me that wants as little competition as possible says, yeah, well, you keep thinking that, right? Because, um, you know, it, it makes it uh, easier for me to get in a door if there's fewer people trying. But um, the altruistic side of me says, you know, that's really all it takes is, I mean, you do have to go figure out, you have to earn it. So I'm not, you know, and this is another thought, like my, our, our, our dad had a really, really strong work ethic, um, uh, had a lot of jobs as a kid, you know, so I, I just don't, I don't believe I'm owed anything. I don't feel entitled to anything, but I feel like if I work hard enough at something um, and have and have the ability to actually do the job I'm being asked to do, um, that there's there's nothing that's out of my reach. So, um, so I, I guess uh, I think I did learn from my dad. You know, you got to hear no more than once, yeah. um, and. Um, and I, I still believe that. I mean, you, I know people are going to say no. And then you have to, and I do believe it's my job to go give them the reason to say yes. Um, so whenever you're pitching an idea or yourself, you know, whoever you're sitting across from, you know, it's hard for them, you know, to pull a trigger, uh, to put themselves on the line to vouch for you, for your idea, because, you know, they, they have someone that they're answering to as well. So, you know, I always look at it. It's my job to help make the person that I'm asking to help me to help them succeed as well. I want them to look smart for taking a flyer on me. So that's why, you know, I, I do my prep work. I, you know, I'm, and I'm trying to send the signal when I'm meeting with somebody, like this, uh, this is going to be a good choice for you. Um, and so, and I guess with, with Beverly, um, I think she just did it as a favor. And she said to me, usually I listen to those and they go right in the trash. Now here's, 
here's what happened with here's what happened with Beverly. Um, if the if the songs hadn't been good, it would have gone in the trash. Yeah. Um, but so I, you know, and I did actually think at the time and still do, I was like, you know, I think Wayne's really good. And I think this is, I, I, it, it wasn't delusional. Right. Um, um, and, the, and there were, I mean, I was, I had the ability to hear a song and hear other songs and go, well, this, this is as good. Right. It's like, right. there's no question. Right. Um, so I, I did believe in the material and the, and so, you know, basically what I'm talking about is how you, how you get open doors or, or, um, so I, I think it always takes somebody to open a door for you and your job is to have the goods when that door gets open because, you know, you only have one chance to make a first impression. And, um, so you want to make sure that if you're out there shopping your wares, that they are ready to be shopped. Um, so that when you, when opportunity does present itself, that um, you can seize on the opportunity. So I, I have usually, I would say my, my batting average is pretty high in terms of when a door is open, having something that was of value to the people on the other side of the door. Um, you know, that's, that's the part where it's not just about tenacity and persistence. It, it, it actually has to do with, you know, some amount of talent and, um, hard work and perseverance and those kinds of things. Yeah. I'm curious if you've ever had like a moment where you decided not to force it or you decided to like let something go or does that come up? Like what is your intuition on that? Like when to be like, all right, maybe I'm going to let this go. Um, or does that not happen? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, um, you know, I, I, I do want, cause I crave, you know, good, working situations. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, sometimes other factors come in like, um, budget, <laughs> you want, money. you, and, or you just want things to be a good fit. So I, yeah. I have always, you know, I have, um, you know, now that I'm in a position where, uh, it's not as hard to get through an open door, but, there's all kinds of people out there making all kinds of different things. Yeah. Um, and so I might have an idea that I'm pitching to somebody who I really like. I mean, I'll, I'll say, uh, I won't name names here because I don't want to, because there's a, a really, really well-known, powerful producer who's a friend of mine that, that I've worked with before. Yeah. Um, and, uh, this is good at a certain kind of movie. And I had a comedy that we ended up doing together and comedy was just not the forte. Um, and so I, I, if I'm, if I'm with, you know, certain people do certain things well and, and the chemistry is right. Um, so I am kind of a believer sometimes of, of the, uh, if it's meant to be, uh, it will be. Um, so I'll be tenacious to a point, but then when you kind of see the other person, you know, like what I was talking about earlier, you're, you're trying to give somebody a, a reason to say yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and those are people who, whose finger, you know, their finger, you picture the fingers quivering over the, uh, the, the green open the door button, you know, the red <laughs> hit the, hit, hit the eject chair button. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and you kind of have to sense it. And I can sense that it's like, oh, yeah, I want to hit this green button. And those are the times when you can go, this is going to be fine. When they're sitting there with arms folded and it's like the red button is about to happen, sometimes no amount of persuading is going to do that. And you're best to move on to somebody else so that, so that the fit is better. I mean, you, don't, you really don't want someone doing something just because you, you, know, you were so relentless that they said, yes to shut you up that's not the best way to to create something right. you know you're what when you're out looking for creative partners you're really looking for somebody who gets what you're you, you want people who plus what you're doing um so um you know that's that's keeping your own sense open for is this the right match i mean that that's when it you get into casting um 
because like when you're when you're the originator of an idea and you're looking for someone to do that idea with that's in a way that's casting you know you're trying to in a way you're hiring your boss you're hiring somebody who's going to have some influence over this thing that you created and you want to make sure that you're all kind of speaking the same language you know um so um yeah does that that does yeah that definitely yeah. does i um i'm curious if we if we get a little bit uh specific with screenwriting are there and i know this may not be the there may not be an answer to this but are there does screenwriting come down to two or three major philosophies was there anything that you were taught or you've learned about screenwriting that is like prevalent in your mind when you go about working on a project I mean, there probably is. It's at this point, I've written so many <laughs> <Yeah>. scripts. <laughs> it's like what <laughs> that I'm not even I'm, that I'm not even sure I can articulate. Okay. What it is, what it is that I know. I mean, there are certain things that I could sort of parrot back of things that I learned, and there are certain quotes over the years. Um. um Certain things that I, you know, I I know why when a script isn't working, why it's not, and it's usually I haven't, you know, it's like answering some of the fundamentals of storytelling. Like, what does the main character want? Why can't they have it? Um, and it, is that want compelling? Is that want something that we can get behind as an audience and root for? Right. Um, for me, for me, that's you know, that's if that isn't there, um, you have problems. And I will say uh, all the movies that I work on, we, I, I, we end up laughing amongst some other writer friends of mine. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little anecdote, but when I was doing over the hedge, I mean, I had been on the movie two years and we were well into making it. And we would do these little check-in screenings all the time with storyboards and, and then have a powwow and get notes. And uh, I mean, the, we, we were literally halfway through the movie and the first note was, yeah, I'm not sure what RJ, the main character, wants. And I was writing the note down and I said, I can't believe I'm still asking this question. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, you would think it's the first question you would answer before you start. And what ends up happening is you just don't start there. Yeah. You start with premise, you know, you start with premise and ideas and funny set pieces. And then you almost always have to back engineer. Like what, what does this guy want? What does this woman want? Um, because, um, it changes, you know, um, and you might start out thinking they want one thing and then the story kind of reveals itself to you as you're working on it a little bit. So, yeah. um, so that one, you know, is one that kind of pops up constantly, um, is, is to how do you articulate that in a nice, simple, gettable, um, compelling way. Um, so I always know in the back of my head that if that isn't answered, it's going to be a, uh, a less compelling read and viewing. Um, so, um, okay. and structure and pace. I mean, uh, Robert Wise, who directed, um, I mean, edited uh, West Side Story, you know, and was a big, um, I mean, edited Citizen Kane, directed West Side Story. Um, wow. We actually cut Charlotte's Web in the room where he edited uh, Citizen Kane. And there was a, a sign that he had over his edit um, table that said pace trumps logic. Um, huh. And, and then I added one to that, which is in humor trumps everything. Um, funny trumps everything, but, uh, yeah. um, but pace trumps logic. Um, a lot of times you'll get hung up on over explaining things and it's like, you know, pace is better. And, uh, um, uh, and it's true. So you try to keep things, you know, brevity is not only the soul of wit, it's, it's the, um, the essential in screenwriting, which is, you know, screenwriting is kind of the, the art of what you don't need to write. You know, um, it's, 
it's kind of the most economical form of writing, sort of, because you have to rely so much on visuals and um, editing and just things things that make a powerful movie that go beyond just the written word, um, which is different than theater, which is different than novels. You know, it's just a different kind of writing. So, um, so I think those are things that 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 constantly kick around and structure. Um, you know, structure, even if you're doing a, an unconventional structure, you have to start with a conventional, right? right? Like there would know, if you look at, if you look at this trend in food service these days, which is, you know, the deconstructed omelet or the, <laughs> the de, the deconstructed olive. It's like, well, that thing wouldn't mean anything to you unless you had reference of a constructed yeah. olive. Um, and, um, so that's, that's what ends up happening. I think, um, you know, if, if you're going to stories have structure and even if you're going to mess around with the structure, like Pulp Fiction did, or like Citizen Kane did, where you're going to, you know, take a, a nonlinear approach to something, you're still referencing a linear approach. If you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. you're doing it in, in contrast to what is expected. Um, and so the implied linear structure of something, which goes back to, um, you know, Aristotle, you know, the beginning, yeah. middle and end. And, um, so, um, and even if you reverse it and you do the end first and go back to the beginning, like, you know, you're still acknowledging the existence of that structure. So, um, and again, I think structure has always been somewhat ingrained in me. Um, so those things I, you know, are just kind of tools that are in my toolbox always when I'm writing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. I'm going to I'm going to change the topic here for a second. Are there common themes that you see among top performers now with your directing, working with, you know, actors or uh, different producers you've worked with or being a producer and working with directors? Do you notice any common themes? Themes in what way? Just in their work ethic, their communication, um, general ways of being. Well, yeah. The one common theme, I think, is that everyone is insecure. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Everyone fears that what they're doing sucks. Everyone fears that their best thing is the last thing they did and it's downhill from here oh my god that's what everyone fears yeah i, I had a meeting with um with jack black to shamelessly name drop but um <laughs> um jack had a uh, a production company we were at the same agency and and he was sort of out actively looking for he wanted to develop projects with writer directors and you know, like instead of just reading scripts and deciding what to jump into, he wanted to get more involved in developing parts for him. And so I went and had a meeting with him to um, kick around a couple of ideas. And uh, somehow the um, conversation came up of other actors that he worked with that were like not as involved as he was trying to be. And, and then he just threw out a phrase to me. He said, yeah, man, I do it because I, I fear the fizzle. Huh. I fear the fizzle. Yeah. Um, and he's like, you see it with everybody. And, uh, you know, and with actors, it's like you can be riding high and then two movies that, that underperform and people say, Oh, it's over for him or over for her. And then they come back and, you know, it's, yeah. And it's a volatile, you know, the, the Academy Awards were last night and I, you watch that and you think back to the Academy Awards six years ago or 10 years ago and you think like oh wow there was a year when jodie foster won two oscars back to back or gwyneth paltrow was winning oscars and it's and it's just like they're just not the same kind of presence anymore so it's a fickle it's a fickle business and those people's talents haven't changed at all you know right um and then right. so they'll you know um so it's uh i have i have noticed um, that people, that that's always kind of there. And particularly like 
actors, like especially when I'm working with like big name actors. Yeah, so I've worked with some pretty big yeah. <laughs> movie stuff. Yeah. Um, and you realize it's like when directing them, I, I, I often kind of make the mistake of going in and go, well, these people, they don't care what I think. You know? it's like, <laughs> yeah. they're, okay. they're huge. So I'm the one working hard, like, oh, God, I hope I don't embarrass myself and then even if i go up to somebody and they'd be like let's do that again say well what what was wrong with it what what's wrong you know like oh. to see them go what what's wrong with that what and it's like oh wow i'm i'm giving off the the vibe that they're not doing well yeah i need to i need to manage everybody you know it's like we're all the same yeah um that they all have the same insecurities and want to do a good job and don't like it when somebody's, you know, and then part of it is like, I don't want to embarrass myself. And, um, but mostly it comes from that fear of like, God, is my best work behind me? That's, that's what everybody fears. Everybody wants to stay relevant. Everybody wants to stay, you know, active and be wanted. And, um, so yeah. that's the common theme. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was watching the Academy Awards last night, and the thought I kept having to myself, you know, with everyone in that room, is like, this is such a subjective uh, field of work, you know, entertainment in general, because it's not really necessarily one individual person that gets you your next step or helps you grow. It's kind of a culmination of multiple people being in agreement with your talent. So making yourself unique and allowing your talent, allowing your talent to be shown, but also like, you know, <laughs> not getting rejected and getting rejected. It's just such an interesting, it was something I was pondering last night and what you said kind of, it reminded me of that. So I wanted to share that. Well, and it's hard to, um, so, you know, obviously I've, I've made some things that go out into the world and, um, I, um, I go through the same process on every one of them, which, kind of teaches me I really am in it mostly for the process. Um, you know, and it's, it's the old, you know, it's not the destination, it's the journey. And I, I do enjoy the journey. And the part of it that I enjoy is creating with other people. Um, you know, that, that part is fun to me. Yeah. Um, because I'm, I'm compelled to just make things, um, it's it's how I deal with my own restlessness, I guess, or my own sense of accomplishment, you know, be it movies, musicals, songs, I do woodworking. I, um, I like, I'm just always making something. Um, and, uh, it's, um, <clears throat> it, it is subjective because what, what ends up happening and especially in this day and age with the internet you know, it goes out there and then people have opinions about it. And I'll, I'll be honest, uh, and it might be just the more I do this, the less and less I want to hear other people's opinions about what I do. Um, uh, and, and part of it is because I don't, I don't want to, um, I don't want my emotional state to be impacted one way or the other. I don't want to feel good about myself because of what a bunch of critics say. Yeah. And I don't want to feel bad about myself either. Um, so, and it's really hard because like, you know, there were eight movies up there last night that a bunch of people said, these are the best of the year. And, and I'm like, yeah, I don't like that one. And I don't like that one. And I didn't, that didn't do it for me. Um, now I would expect that those filmmakers are like, yeah, well, different strokes. Right. Yeah. But we're not. It's like it's annoying when people don't like what you do. Yeah. Um, yes. So, and um, and when they write about it and pick it apart, and and then other factors come in, like oh, they're just trying to sell newspapers, and you know, I, I remember there was a particularly scathing review review of the last movie I did, Smallfoot, and for the most part, you know, it was well received and. There's a there's always somebody out there who takes pot shots at you and um, yeah this one this one particular review was just brutal 
And I had told myself I'm not going to read any reviews, and but somebody sent. I just happened to come across this one, and it was ruthless. And then I told somebody else, I was like, "Wow, that was rough." And they're like, "Well, their 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 publication is dying, um, oh, and so they're just it's all it's all clickbait. I mean, they're just trying to get people to, you know, it's sensationalized and negative and snarky uh, because they're going under." And I was like, "Oh, well, that sucks." <laughs> like, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. but, um, so, um, yeah, I, I forget when I make something, um, that when it gets down to like, oh, now I'm out doing press and I'm doing interviews and, um, reading, I try not to read any of it, but getting a sense of what people's opinions are. And I just, I really just hate that part of it. Um, you know, making these things is fun because you, you're working with some creative people and it's really, really great to be able to work with super talented people, people at the top of their field, because you're all kind of, you know, plussing each other's work. Yeah. Um, but the, um, the, the, the opinion part of it, the commerce side of it, the, the, it, it gets judged by it's how it does at the box office or how much money it makes or what awards it makes. And it's sort of like, uh, that part of it just gets a little, um, I, I really don't enjoy that part of it. Yeah. Um, so, you, you know, um, it's, uh, it's funny because, and I had this thought as a young child reading, you know, just like if I ever saw a review on a film that I liked and it was negative, I was always like, well, why don't you're not writing any films? How can you be negative <laughs> about this film? You haven't written one. You know, like, do it yourself if you don't like it. But you're right. It's that, yeah. you know, it's sensationalism and it sells. Do you have any opinions that you do trust or people that you check in with when you're working on something? Or is it usually just the people on the team of a project you're working on? No, there are, you know, um, somebody asked me one time, like, what's the definition of a good producer? Huh. What um, is <laughs> Or a, or a good studio executive, you know, like, um, and I was trying to figure out like, oh, yeah, how, how do I define this? But for me, a good producer, a good studio executive, a good director, anyone like that, is someone whose opinion you want on a project that's not theirs, that you're not working on with them. Okay. So if you're on a project somewhere else and it's like, I wonder, you know, who's up? whose thoughts I really want right now are Scott's. And he, he produced the last movie I did and I'm, he's not on this one, but I'd sure like to know what he thinks because I respect his opinion and his taste. So a lot of times it's just trying to find people whose, uh, whose tastes you line up with. Um, and so I have writer friends and director friends and producer friends that if I'm in the middle of something and kind of losing its way, it's like, Hey, can you read this and give me your thoughts? Um, you know, someone whose opinion I really respect, that often helps to um, unblock the dam if there's any dam um, as you're trying to get your way through something. Um, but that's that's why you're in the middle of making something. Once something is made, there's just no accounting for taste, you know. No. Um, so, you know, I have, I, I will say there was some, reviews on I mean this is sort of jumping ship but on so on something rotten yeah um, which was kind of our uh, darling you know it's it's an idea that we've been kicking around for had been kicking around for 15 years and finally wrote it and uh, it was original um, we worked really hard on it um, and when it came out um, and people especially like top critics you know kind of dismissed it as being fluffy or, you know, um, that one was a little bit like, I mean, I remember sitting with Wayne and just going, all right, well, I don't know if I can do any better than that. Honestly, like it was really, that great. was, uh, <laughs> it was really, great. I mean, I, I, I sort of watched it and went, well, I'm really proud of it and I'm entertained and, um, I feel like we worked hard and, um, you know, I think it's more clever than, these guys are giving it credit for being, but, um, so I'm like, yeah, all right. If you're saying my best isn't good enough. Well, okay. Uh -huh. 
Uh, but at some point, I don't even know why I give those guys that much power because it's just one person, you know? Yeah. Um, and um, I will say like that, this review I was talking about with Smallfoot, like it, it, it really affected my mood for a day. Then I went and sat down and I was like, who is this guy? And I looked up this critic and I was like, what does he like? And then when he list, you know, you would see all of his positive reviews. It's like, I hated that. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I was like, of course you're not going to, you know, you're not going to, we're not going to line up, you know, it's just, he has different tastes. And so when you're sitting around and some people it's, you know, it, 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 the Oscars brings it out. It was like, what was your favorite film of the year? And somebody would list it. It's like, well, really? Well, I couldn't stand that. So yeah. why do I want that person's opinion on my work? Like, why do I care? It's like, if that's what you think is great, I don't. So I don't, I don't need your opinion on, on what I've done. So, um, doesn't, doesn't stop it from a, a really, you know, really all these opinions and particularly internet trolls and people who hide behind anonymous names, you know, Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> you know, theater girl 26, you know, ripping apart something rotten. And I just want to go, who are you? theater girl and what have you uh created uh and that's that that's the kind of brings out the worst part in you um right but uh because i don't know when people dismiss something that took so long to create and took so much of your energy and you kind of put your heart into uh it feels very um i don't know super inconsiderate i guess it just to be that flippant about something yeah um and, uh, and it's like, uh, I don't know. Do you know the food critic, Jonathan Gold? I'm not familiar with Jonathan. Yeah. He was an LA based food critic, big, you know, re- really well-respected food critic who unfortunately died last year, but he had this, uh, um, philosophy, which I really respect, which was he would go out and eat at restaurants. He only gave good reviews. <laughs> Uh, if he didn't like something, he wouldn't review it. Um, so his attitude is sort of like, so that's damning enough that a a restaurateur is like, Oh, he's not reviewing it, which means, you know, uh, but he's like, I don't want to put negative stuff out there. It's too hard to open a restaurant. It's too hard to keep it. You know, I don't, I don't want to be the reason why a restaurant closes. Yeah. Um, and I really think, you know, you kind of wish some, uh, you know, New York theater critic had the same, you know, they, they quit making, you know, pissing all over shows their sport because these things are hard to make. They're they're The commerce and time, it's hard to get them going. Yeah. And it's, that's why I'm kind of grateful for websites like Rotten Tomatoes and, um, you know, where you can, things don't live or die by a couple of people's opinions. And you can, you can get a better litmus test. You know, so things like Greatest Showman kind of defying the odds and, yeah. you know, still finding an audience. It's great. That's the positive side of the Internet going, no, no, this is good. Um, so it can cut both ways. That's so that's so true. And I've seen recent more recent musicals that have come out and have gotten reviews that I was like, you know what? Those reviews would have been perfect for something rotten. <laughs> Those the you know what someone's taste is though. You're absolutely right going taking a look at what they like and then you're like, "Oh, huh. They just it doesn't sit with them well, or whatever the case is." What's annoying too is that I don't think the general public that's reading these things quite understands what's going on. No. Um which is which is that there's politics involved, and especially yeah. um, when there's awards, um, you know, these critics they go and and they're human. They have shows that they want to win, and and shows that they don't, and they can use the power of the pen to influence that, and they do. Yeah. Um, and so it's not just straight pure opinion you know, there's agenda as yeah. well. And that's, that's the part where you sort of feel like, okay, well now we're playing dirty. Uh-huh. Um, and, uh, and it's, that's, that's the part that I feel like is a little too cavalier and an abuse, abuse of your, 
of your power. I mean, I, I think it's one thing to, you know, to go and show where, to say where something is weak. You know, I don't think people should give all positive reviews, but um, when they're so blisteringly negative and snarky and feels brutal. like someone has an ax to, yeah. It's just brutal. It's, um, uh, okay. Um, in life, what's most important to you? Uh, just in my life? Yeah, in your life. Um, is my relationships. Um, um, and being the kind of person that one should be to another person, um, especially people that I care about that are in my orbit, that are in my life. So, you know, my family, obviously, my kids, my wife, um, my immediate family, my friends, um, you know, having a life well lived um, uh, where it's not like I want people to think I'm a nice guy. I think that word is kind of bland. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I think it's more about, um, you know, were you a good uh, friend, partner, father, um, in that, uh, basically you're, you're someone who can be there when, when the stuff that really matters happens. I mean, all this that we're talking about, um, matters to a certain extent, but we're, we're really just talking about entertainment. Yeah. <laughs> Every, yeah. Everything we've been talking about for an hour is pure entertainment. And I don't um, discount, um, you know, it, it, it has been thrilling, particularly on Something Rotten, to go see it as many times as I have. And sometimes I'll just stand off and, to the side and watch the audience react and, yeah. um, and to see them laughing and uh, having a couple of hours of pure joy and escapist joy is really rewarding. And um, we've gotten some incredibly touching letters from people who were like, uh, we went to the show. My mom's been diagnosed with terminal cancer. She hasn't laughed in a year. Wow. This lifted her spirit, you know, stuff like that is like, wow, that, that is more powerful than um, anything I ever imagined it would do, you know? So um, there's something about those experiences and, and watching what audiences do during that show that is incredibly rewarding. So I'm not discounting, you know, the potential healing power of entertainment, but in terms of what your everyday life is, yeah. um, what's more important to me is, is being a person that somebody um, can count on, um, someone that I can put their needs ahead of my own, um, you know, so it's sort of like what makes you the kind of person uh, that is a worthy person to be associated with. Um, that's probably the most important thing to me. And it's the common theme that runs through. It's like when I'm, col when I'm collaborating with someone creatively, you know, being a good collaborator, um, pushing each other to do your best work. I mean, um, and that's, that's either in a creative process or even just in any process. It's like the people that you want to be around are the people who understand you, who somehow make you a better person, either by example or by the way they challenge you. Um, I think those are the um, most important things to me. And when you keep those important, the, the rest of this doesn't matter. You know, a, a, bad, a bad review in the New York Times or... Uh, it's it's so transient. It just doesn't matter in the long scheme of things. And if you keep the other things, uh, relationships, the other things that are real. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. <laughs> um, and this will be name dropping, but um, <laughs> great, great. Um, well, and I hope I don't get. I mean, I won't get in trouble for this. But um, I was. There was a period I, I was I was in New York um, doing 
uh, press junket for Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And um, and while I was doing that, um, Charlotte's Web was being made in Australia, and and um, and I was uh, in the middle of directing, writing, and directing um, over the hedge. Um, so uh, I went to this press junket, and unwittingly, because I'm not very seasoned in dealing with the press, but unwittingly, I announced the cast of Over the Hedge because some reporter asked me some sneaky questions. So. Oh. I had, I had the uh, the head of DreamWorks marketing really mad at me. And then someone from Australia asked a question about Charlotte's Web. And uh, I had just had a uh, recording session the night before in New York with Julia Roberts, who was doing the voice of Charlotte. And um, and it's the first time she had seen footage from the uh, the movie. And when she saw the, you know, the footage of, of young Wilbur the pig, she, you know, she put her hand to her mouth and she goes, oh, my God, he's so cute. I'm going to cry. So I I said this because somebody asked how Charlotte's Web was going yeah. from Australia, yeah. where they shot it. So I told that story. Well, the next morning, the producer of Charlotte's Web and like, <laughs> I get this phone call. It's like, oh, Julia Roberts, people are very upset with you. And it's like, what? It's like, yeah, you're not supposed to be talking about this. And there and. I was laying in bed uh, reading this email and uh, next to my wife. And I was like, oh, God, I was like, my stomach was in knots. It's like, how did I piss off Julia Roberts people? Um, and and <laughs> she sent me an email from next to me. She's like, yeah. here's five headlines of what's going on in the world. So please send this to Julia Roberts people and say an ounce of perspective, please. <laughs> oh, it's... and it was like you know wars and and hunger and it's like come on are you really going to get bent out of shape because julia roberts people meaning her publicist is angry that you said something and i'm like yeah it's true um wow. it's like this doesn't matter um so that was you know, I, I guess what matter. I guess it's a way that I'm trying to say, it's like trying to be a good citizen of the world. Yeah. Um, to to be, to have given more than you've taken, and to have been some kind of positive influence. You know, I think progress is a, you know, is a is a big thing for me. It's like I, I like a I like a sense that we're moving forward. Um, and, uh, and I think the great quest, um, for humankind is this quest to get outside of self. Um, for me, that's where all the, you know, like, I think it's our animal nature to sort of hover in the cave, to protect, to defend, you know, it takes a real leap of faith to go out and. Uh, put your trust in somebody else. Um, um, but that's, that's progress. That's what makes us, you know, sort of a higher species, if you will. Um, and it's really hard to do. When you look at the things that bring the world down, they're just the basic. It's like greed, lust, you know, and all of it is, has, is when you just, it's self-serving as opposed to putting somebody else's needs in front of your own. Um, yeah. And we just struggle with that constantly. That's all the news. All of it. Yeah, just <laughs> All of it. That's why to me, storytelling is so powerful because you read the news, it's all heroes, victims, and villains. Um, that's all we're, that's all we're dealing with all day and conflict resolution and stories. <laughs> help us help us to make sense of it yeah you know? oh my god yeah wow carrie this is this conversation is incredible thank you thank you i have um sure. three questions left and then you're free to go <laughs> okay. Uh, okay i'm curious you mentioned woodworking what do you what do you enjoy building um you know again part of it uh I mean, I'm sitting at my desk in my recording studio, which I built to my, you know, because I wanted 
certain specs. Um, and I, the book shelves in my audience. I, I mean, I, I, I like, so I'll be in the space. I mean, I think what I do a lot of is kind of, I'll be in a space looking at like, what would make this space a little bit more efficient? I'm, I'm kind of an efficiency fiend. Yeah. Um, and um, I'll be looking and it's like, oh, I need a shelf there. It's, and a lot of times I'm also super cheap. Um, <laughs> sometimes, to a, sometimes to a fault because I'm, I'd probably end up better off in the long run if I was using my time to go out and do what I get paid to do and let somebody else but like, for instance, this desk I'm sitting at, I had this idea, I drew up the design and uh, had a woodworker come in. He was like, yeah, that'll be $5,000. I was like, what? Uh, <laughs> I can make that, for, I can make that for 500 easy. Yeah. Um, which, uh, which I did. So some of it is like, ah, that's ridiculous. I'm not gonna, but also um, woodworking ends up being a little bit of a palate cleanser for me. Yeah, I believe um, it. Because everything, everything I work on takes so long to make. Yeah. Because I do so much animation and these Broadway shows or whatever. So when I'm working on it, have an idea that can take four years before you see the finished product or three years. What's nice about woodworking is I can have an idea and in a weekend, when I'm done, it's like there. It's the Sondheim song. Look, I, I made a hat where there, where there never was a hat. Um, yeah. I think I think it's somewhat of a of a palate creative palate cleanser for me to have made something to have thought of something because the process for me is very similar. You sit down with a piece of paper, you design. You know, it has structure, it has symmetry, um, it has creativity, and then you go implement. It doesn't always go according to design. You improvise. Uh, so it's a little mini creative process for me that, um, and it just gives me, it's probably some pathetic, you know, like getting self-worth from the sense of accomplishment. Um, but I do enjoy it. And I like, um, I like going out in my little wood shop and turning the radio on and listening to this American life or the moth radio hour or the news or, um, and just, um, kind of unplugging. Yeah. Uh, working with my hands, making something, um, learning, learning new ways to do things. I think that's what I like. Yeah. Keeps life kind of interesting for me. Like I've been watching a lot of woodworking videos on YouTube lately and it's like, Oh, that's how you do that joint yeah. or that, you know, I, I really, I really love learning tricks. So things that looked, and that can be anything from woodworking to when you're doing music demos or like, how do you get that sound? It's like, oh, well, there's this machine. You push that. It's like, oh, look at that. It's not as hard as I thought it was, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, but learning from other people. So um, I've made, I make, lately I've been making these boxes from, I made my daughter a tea box. I made my son a little fold up box. Um, but mostly it's like, you know, bedside tables and, you yeah. know, um so i would say furniture what mostly what made the desk <laughs> what made the desk five thousand dollars <laughs> does it is it a soundboarding soundboard desk like tv screen holds up yeah computer screens yeah it raises and lowers um you know it has all my rack mount stuff for my gear um wow. okay. i had to fit into a certain space so i you know, built these cabinets that roll in and out of other cabinets so I can get to the back of them. And, and uh, but it's labor. I mean, it's just, you know, this guy coming in and yeah, because, you know, he's got a shop and overhead and I, mean, I get it. Um, yeah. And he's a master, master woodworker. But I was like, that's overkill for what I need here. You know, I can, I mean, he's built, he built some other things. Um, he built some stuff that I could have, he built a cabinet I could have built. Uh, it wouldn't have been as good as what he did. Um, huh. So, but I'm, and part of it is I like, I like these projects to, uh, um, to learn, you know, like there's two things for me when I'm woodworking. It's like, oh, this is something I, so I've never worked with this, uh, like I've never worked with dovetail joints or I've never done that. So I'm going to do that on this project and learn that thing. 
Uh, and then it's usually an excuse for me to buy a new tool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <isn't it? laughs> uh, so I can outfit my, cause I love, I love tools and I could spend hours in a hardware store in home Depot. Uh, uh, I just, I don't know. I've, I've always loved tools. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but yeah, we are Wayne and I, but I mean, Wayne does his, he makes these clocks. Um, and we both talk about like just going out in your garage and like, I'm not dealing with music and I'm not dealing with story problem. And it's, I'm still going through the same process. Right. Um, but it's not the same frustrations. Um, and I'm usually in the middle of something. And then I, once I do that, I go back to my other process and, um, I'm a firm believer in what they call the secondary process, which is if I'm struggling with a story problem or a song that's not quite working, when I step away and go do something else, I always come back to that problem a little bit renewed and with a different perspective. And um, I call it the guitar, the, the, the dropped guitar pick syndrome. Um, that when I'm sitting here recording and playing my guitar and I'm strumming away with a pick and then inevitably the pick goes flying. Yeah. Or just drops and I can hear it. It drops and I hear the click and then I'm sitting here and I look around and cannot see it. Cannot see the guitar pick anywhere. You know, and I'm standing up, I'm looking around and the more I look for it, the more frustrated I get so because in my head I'm like, I'm like, this is ridiculous. It's here. I heard it. <laughs> right, right. And then before I get really frustrated and put my fist through the screen or something, say, all right, get up, walk away, go get something to drink, you know, come back. And there it is sitting right on my chair. So right. <laughs> it's like the frustration of not finding it is blinding me to where it is. So that's the whole creative process is like that for me sometimes. It's like walk away, take a breather do something else uh, and then come back. Don't give it up completely, but come back to it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Palette cleanse. What, yes. um, do you have any most gifted books, books you love or have loved favorite books? Uh, instructional books or just books in general? You know what? They can be on life. They can be on screenwriting, on communication, on directing, entertainment, woodworking, anything really. Um, yeah, I, um, there's a book that I used a lot, uh, cause, um, I met this author when I was at Disney, he wrote this memo just about a way to approach storytelling, which was using Joseph Campbell's <clears throat> hero with a thousand faces. Um, and he wrote a book called the writer's journey, Okay. which, um, was really eye opening for me as a writer approaching things from this archetypal storytelling paradigm that to me was fresher than the stuff that was the hit of the day, which was Sid Field's three act structure. And, right. and, uh, and Sid, Sid was a teacher of mine at, at SC, but I was starting to find that, you know, where's your act one break? Where's your act two break? Where's your midpoint? All of that was starting to feel very formulaic. And uh, this writer's journey thing came along and approached it more from a character's journey, which I found more useful. So that's, that's been a good book. Um, um, I mean, I just, I read a book not too long ago called uh, my thoughts be bloody, which was about uh, John Wilkes Booth and his brother Edwin and what the real reason behind the Lincoln assassination uh, just that whole family um, was really a great, I love history. So any, any stuff that goes into historical events, um, I really like, uh, what's the most recent book I read, I just read a book called the big picture, okay. which is about okay. the studio business. Um, and how it's a guy, uh, who's a New York, New Yorker reporter, or uh, or, what did he write for? He was writing this for the Atlantic. Um, but uh, he got a hold of all the uh, the hacked Sony emails. Oh no. Um, oh, no. 
and uh, and was going to write a piece just about that. But what he what he did was um, realize that this book was chronicling the changing of the studio system and how we got into this Marvel um, universe, Netflix, yeah. um, um, and um, uh, so that was that was a really good book just in terms of what's going on in um, uh, um, in in the business. It's written by a guy named uh, Ben Fritz, um, okay. and uh, so that was an eye-opening book in terms of why we are where we are in entertainment right now. Um, and, you know, works of, um, I tell you what I've been drawing a lot of inspiration from lately is This American Life, yeah. um, the podcast, because um, they're such good storytellers. Um, and the way they structure those, and even their podcast, like S-Town and things like that, they're yeah. just, I've been marveling at, at um, how well they're structured. Just the fundamentals of storytelling and the way they pull you through a story. Um, I've been loving that. Uh, so. Wow. That's great. No, that's really great. I actually haven't seen or listened to This American Life. I have to check that one out. And you're not the first person uh, to tell me. And I've heard well, I just, it's great. Yeah. Yeah, it's just. I live in Los Angeles. So when I was commuting to Warner Brothers, uh, making small foot, the commute was brutal, and uh, listening <laughs> to the news was filling filling me with anger. Uh, in just terms of what was it was all during the election and politics, and so I would just show up like being stuck in traffic and hearing the news. So I switched over and started listening to This American Life, and the stories would just I'd get lost in them, and then not care that I was in traffic, right? Um, and kind of show up in a good hopeful mood. I don't know. They're, they're just a bunch of really smart people over there uh, who really know how to weave a story and, uh, and the stories are compelling. Um, and then the, the moth radio hour too. I, I, I kind of love that because uh, uh, it's not so journalistic as it is just people out sharing their stories and the power of storytelling. I, just, it's, uh, never, yeah. Yeah, never ceases to amaze me um, how someone just sharing a story can move you to tears. Um, it's amazing. It really is. It really is. It's such a. It's such. It's. We need it. <laughs> we need the storytelling, which is a big reason why yeah. I'm so grateful that you've shared so many of yours on this this conversation. I feel yeah. like there's so much. There's so much to be learned from what you've done and what you've overcome and life these days has become so simple and so at the touch of your fingertips that to hear the extensive work you went into when getting you know what you wanted or making it easy for someone to say yes i think is so important because especially you know people my age or younger things are very easy <laughs> to find as you know compared to what they used to be you know, people are very easy to contact and yet everyone, you know, I hear a lot of people saying, well, I, I'm not getting what I want or I'm not getting this or I'm not getting that. And it's such a good philosophy you have of like, well, are you making it easy for someone to say yes? So, well, plus I always, cause I do a lot of, um, you know, having gone to USC, I, I signed up to be part of the, um, their mentorship program. So there's some students that when they're graduating, I meet with to talk about next steps in their career and, and, and this is something that I end up talking about a lot, which is, you know, the world reacts, especially just this is purely commerce. You know, this is purely like in entertainment, getting noticed. Um, they react to doers. They react to people who um, are out doing things and creating things. And again, giving people a reason to say yes. Um, the hardest way to get someone to say yes is when you're standing there with, you know, metaphoric hat in hand going, please, please give me this job. Nobody wants that. No. You know, what people want is to be your, your creative partner. Um, and 
And uh, I always say it's a fear-based industry. So the people who are out there in positions to do the hiring, <laughs> it's, it's a pretty simple formula. When you're out trying to get started, what you're hoping is that you can make some kind of livelihood out of doing this, you know, to make, to make a living and to be able to do this and have that be, you're not doing it between shifts at Starbucks or, or whatever, which is sometimes an important part of the process right. of, of getting you to want something bad enough that you have to go through all of the pain and suffering of facing your own failures and fears. And, um, but the people that you are out there hoping will hire you, it's a fear-based industry. Um, it is, um, it, it's, you have to realize that those people are mostly operating in some kind of fear because they have people above them. And the fear is either I'm going to make this choice and it's going to backfire and be bad and make me look bad. Right. And the fear can work the other way, which is if I don't say yes to this, I'm going to be the idiot who, who said Harry Potter was not a good book. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be, you know, the industry is littered with people who say, yep, he passed on that or, you know, and, and uh, people live in that fear that they're going to go to their boss and go, did you really, was this script sent to you and this person? And now they're the hottest thing. And you said, no, you know, that looks bad too. So right. it, it's a tough position for them to be in. Um, and what I tell people is you want to go out and capitalize on the fact that you want that fear to be, if I don't jump on this train, I'm going to look like an idiot. And the way to do that or young creative people is to go create things and, and use the tools that are out there. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm sitting here right now looking at my laptop and my phone, and that is more firepower than I ever had as a student at USC. Yeah. Ever. So I have a 1080p, high def camera on my phone and editing software that comes free with my Macintosh. <laughs> and uh, um, and it's um, so it's uh, um, the firepower of yeah. the phone and the computer. Well, yeah, but it's like make something and and then you have a distribution outlet. You have YouTube, you have Facebook, you have Twitter, you have ways that you can get your creativity out there. Um, so go make something instead of going the path of like, I wrote a script, please buy it, which is fine. But it's like, what are you doing that's out there showing someone that you are a go-getter? And again, it's removing that, that, fear of saying no. It's like, if I hire this guy, this guy, you know, or this woman is going to make my life easier and make me look good. Right. Um, and then also, if you're going out and actually making things and editing, it only sharpens your skills of, you know, um, what it's like to make things. I mean, I write differently having directed Huh. Um, I write, I write differently now movies than when I, uh, when I was writing before I had directed something because I've been in the cutting room. I now know what kind of stuff doesn't make it in, what's superfluous, what, you know, so I just write, I write different. And it's, so if people go out and actually make things or, um, you know, uh, I have a, one writing student I was talking to and he went out and did stand up and filmed himself and got, you know, it's just out doing something besides just, I wrote a script and let me send it in and hope somebody buys it. That, that is very, very low percentage. You know, it's, it's fine, but that shouldn't be the only thing you're doing in my right. opinion. Right. Agreed. No, um, I agree. I mean, there's really no, <laughs> with how easy everything is, there's like no excuse not to just make it, you know, good enough is okay. Cause you can make it better, but don't sit and just wait. Exactly. This is great. Wow. Carrie, 
thank you for chatting with me. <laughs> thank you for my, sharing my all of this. If there was a word or phrase that you could put on a billboard for millions of people to see, does anything come to mind? I'd probably say persevere. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's that been be... that's been evident in this conversation. <laughs> yeah. That you persevere. Uh, that would be it. Is there uh, any parting any parting words? Anything else you want to share with the listeners before we end this conversation? Um, We've covered a lot. <laughs> well, you know, this is again another kind of mantra that I live by. But um, I, I see I've seen this a lot in in people over the years. But I realize. Um, a lot of people are going to put obstacles in your way and say you can't do something and you shouldn't be one of them. Yeah. Um, and that I see that a lot in people that it's like people that just get in their own way. Right. Um, and, uh, I think it's pretty hard to do actually to go out and to sit and to create something and to claim it's like it has value my point of view is worthy of being heard. Um, it's unique. It's unique to me. And, and finding that is kind of the, uh, the journey of a, any creative person. Right. Is, is finding a voice that feels authentic. Um, but, and then claiming some sort of authority on it. Like, yeah, people would find this interesting or my point of view and, thickening your skin up enough to where you can weather the people who go, that's not any good. Um, you know, it's, it's a bit of a journey to figure out which of that is a, just opinion that can be dismissed or what, which of it you should take to heart as you try to better yourself in whatever it is that you're creating. Um, so, um, but if you can remove that part of you that gets in the way. If, if you're the one saying, I can't do something, uh, if you can remove that obstacle, um, it changes a lot. It changes the way you are in meetings. Um, again, giving people the tools to say yes, part of that is being a, a person that is a strong, confident person in a room so that that person who is saying yes is, um, taking a bet on somebody that's going to deliver, you know? Um, and so you, you can't fake it. You got to kind of actually go figure out. Uh, well, I guess you do fake it some, I mean, I fake it plenty in meetings. I mean, I, I've been in many meetings where people are like, is this something you can do? I go, oh yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah no problem. <laughs> and then figure it out. go home that day and look up on YouTube. How do you do this or whatever it is? Right. Um, but, um, you know, and sometimes I get myself into trouble, but not that often because I kind of legitimately do believe. It's like, mm. I mean, if somebody says, can you build a nuclear reactor? I'm like, no, I can't do that. Right. But, uh, you know, could you write this kind of thing or could you direct a movie or could you say, yeah, how hard can that be? Right. Uh, uh, so that would be my advice. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's an interesting balance between like, you know what your lane is. So you stay in your lane, but you know how far out of it you can go without, you know, crashing. For instance, directing the producing, but avoiding the nuclear reactor building situation. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Carrie, thank you so much. Thank you so much for talking with me. I really appreciate this. My pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Carrie Kirkpatrick. You've been listening to Entertainment X, the podcast. You can follow Entertainment X on Instagram at underscore Entertainment X underscore. If you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join Clay next week for another curiosity conversation on Entertainment X. Thank you for listening. <laughs>